Chapter 8, Part 2, The Talk Looking out into the cold afternoon air, there just across the deep blue water, flowing, flowed my iceberg. It was just as I had left it some hours before, flowing by us in a field of ice chunks and debris. Take a look at your iceberg, the turtle said to me. I already was looking at the iceberg by this time. I had grown familiar with it and did in fact recognize it as being my own floating iceberg. Alfred continued to speak on the subject. First, recognize that just like you, the iceberg has simple components. There is a part of the iceberg you can see and there is a part of the iceberg that you cannot see. Now you can tell me all about the part that you can see, and you could even refer to the parts of it that I don't see. This view of yourself would change from time to time as you forgot things about yourself and as you recall things. At any given moment, the view of yourself is from the top, seeing the known and, and, and not seeing the unknown. The point I'm trying to make is that if you ask yourself why you did something, all you can share is what you know about yourself from the top part of your iceberg looking down. Now, take a look out there as Alfred buttoned up the top of his parka and pointed out across the water to the other icebergs that sat in the sea alongside mine. I would like to talk about the other icebergs, about how two icebergs in this vast ocean may relate to each other. This is what I call the other rational point of view that you may come across in your life, the point of view of your romantic partner. This may seem pretty obvious, but listen closely. What happens next may get tricky. You see, the second iceberg doesn't see you from your point of view, and you don't see the other iceberg from its point of view either. While you would describe yourself using your perceptions and thoughts, your understanding of you may also include perceptions and thoughts from the other iceberg as well. So how is the other's view of you different from your view of you? Let's, look, let's keep looking at these icebergs. As you sit upon the top of your iceberg, you see things about yourself. This view from the top can become quite obstructed, though, as you look down through the icy blue depths of your iceberg. All this you see. While this is as accurate a view as you can get from the top of your iceberg, and it is valid, the person sitting upon the other iceberg sees you from an entirely different perspective. Now we jump to the rational challenge. Using this perspective of the two icebergs side by side, how I see myself and how I tell you about myself will be different from what someone on the other iceberg will see. And, and simultaneously, the reverse is true. How you see yourself and what you tell me about yourself will be different from what I see of you. Now, two points of view exist and both are val valid. This can be uh, shared or kept secret, but we cannot deny that both exist. Anyone who is challenged with, in dealing with differences, who is seeking the right or truth or correct, may have trouble with this. This is part of why it is so important in communication to label your views as yours and my views as mine, to make coexistence of two correct points of view easy to handle. This is part of why talking about facts and unlabeled point of view is so dangerous. You see, sitting on my iceberg and looking at yours, I will see things about you, things that you do not know about. You, sitting on your iceberg, will see things about me that I don't know about. I personally think this is a tremendous advantage to have someone who can see things about me that I can't. On the other hand, this could result in great conflict if I didn't want to see parts of myself that I felt ashamed of, for example. While this is first seemed confusing to me, continued the turtle, as I practiced using this concept, it, be, it came to be more and more simple and easy. Let me add for you what I think is the only more really difficult challenge. The simplest form and effect of feeling is the emotion of like or don't like. Now, we cannot stop this emotion. It happens in us. We can be aware of it or not. We can share it or keep it a secret. For the moment, let's ignore the emotion, but understand that there is a continuum from intense to dislike or intense like in all of us. Now, and the turtle pointed out across the water, take a look back out there at the icebergs. As you look 
at the other one, the one of your romantic partner floating alongside, there will be parts of it that you like and parts of it that you do not like. Beyond that, there will even be parts of it that you can't even see. Now look closely now. See the icebergs floating out there in the vast frozen sea? If I was sitting on one and you on the other, there are clearly parts of each that neither of us could see from our angle. There may be things there that you like and things that you do not like. Let's get a little closer, Alfred said. Closer, I said. How can we get closer? Come with me, as the turtle gestured down a steep embankment of ice and snow that led to a small dock with a rowboat. Come with me, he stated again, as I followed as we descended the face of the gully and climbed on board the small wooden boat. How close can you get to an iceberg? How, how close can you get to an iceberg? I asked again in a rushed and concerned voice. Well, the turtle slowly added as we pushed from the dock. It is dangerous to approach any iceberg. It can cave or roll, creating a huge disturbance in the water, which can upset a little boat like this. There is no rule for safe space between them because certain icebergs may have long underwater rams, which pose even great, greater threat as an unwary vessel such as ours. Usually a minimum distance of the iceberg length should be kept, although even at this distance safety cannot be guaranteed. It is even more dangerous to attempt to get on an iceberg. Falling ice is a threat, and a rolling bird can dump you in very cold water before collapsing over on top of you. So what are we going to do? I asked. We're going to get on that iceberg, he said. He rode across the body of water, cold and frozen as it was, and landed on the small open ice patch. He motioned to a tall, uh, he motioned uh, to a trail uh, with a rope and said, climb up to the top. He climbed with me all the way to the top of the iceberg, and for a turtle, turtle, it was quite impressive. Okay, he explained as we finally pulled ourselves up to the highest point on the berg. Now, this is your iceberg, and let's just say that that iceberg, uh, that iceberg way over there, let's, let's just say that, that that is my iceberg. Just an example. Do you understand? Are you ready? Yes, I said in return, and he continued. Now, look over the sides of your iceberg, he said. There's a fantastic variety of shapes that result from the deterioration process of icebergs. All despite the fact that no two icebergs are the same, there are certain characteristics and categories of shapes that are used for iceberg observation. Often we use the terms tabular, blocky, wedge, dome, pinnacle, or dry dock. In your case here, I would call your iceberg a pinnacle. In any case, look over the side. I did what he asked. I looked over the side of my iceberg, holding onto the rope, so not to slip. It was, it, was, it was white with a tinge of deep blue descending throughout. Then I saw how it just disappeared into the water below. And Alfred continued. Now this area represents the parts of you that you can see and the parts, of, and the parts that I can see from my iceberg as well. You like these parts of you and I like these parts of you. No problem there. An example would be, you think you have a good sense of humor, and I happen to like uh, your sense of humor as well. Now look over the side of my iceberg once again. This represents the parts of you that you can see that you do not like, and that I can see and that I don't like either. This could be a little problem there, like uh, you are forgetful, you know it, and your forgetting thoughts annoy me as well. Now look at the part right there on the other iceberg that sits below the waterline. Alfred was pointing across the water to the other iceberg, making sure that I was looking at the water line of the iceberg, of the other iceberg. On your iceberg, you cannot see this part from here, but I can see it from mine. This represents parts of you that you don't know about, parts of you, uh, parts that you cannot see, but I can, and that I actually like. This seems an awkward challenge. An example of this might be, you are confident. You are not aware of this, but you have these behaviors. I really like what comes across as your self-confidence, but you don't even realize that you have it. Now look once again at the parts right there on the other iceberg that sits right below the waterline. Alfred was pointing across the water to the other iceberg once again. On your iceberg, you cannot see this part from here, but I can see it from mine. This can also represent the parts of you that you don't know about that are negative. Parts that you cannot see, but I can see from my iceberg, and that you really don't like. This can be a big challenge. An example of this might be that you are arrogant. You are not aware of this, but you have this behavior, that I, and I see it. 
I really don't like what comes across as your arrogance all the time, and you don't even realize that you have it. Now, Alfred looked at me. Do you have any questions? No. Good, the turtle returned with. Now, often icebergs are very unstable. A highly random shape and non-uniform melting and breakup of an iceberg can lead to frequent shifts in orientation. Tabular bergs are generally the most stable, whereas domed and wedge-shaped spring uh, bergs may roll completely over in seconds without any apparent provocation. You really never know what is going to happen to any one iceberg, though, so it's best we get off this one as soon as possible. Let's go. So we climbed down, accessed the small boat, and quickly rowed back across the water to the small makeshift dock on the main shore. I brushed off the cold fog and of the sea and began walking back into the tunnel with the turtle for the long trek back to the university. So far, so far, Alfred continued as we walked into the tunnel, I have shared how there are two points of view about, from, uh, about each person. Not only are these points of view different, they often have lots of value judgments involved. In attempting to learn to understand each other and validate each other, I think this has to be dealt with directly. So here is a little story, and Alfred continued. When I was a little turtle, I was raised by a very polite turtle family. I learned that polite turtles often smile politely when they are angry. I even learned to smile when angry myself. For many years, this was baffling to me. My my parents would get tired of me and then say, he's tired and he needs to go to bed. I learned at the rock where we ate dinner that when, when, when my dad would say the worms look good, he actually meant past the worms. The discrepancy between this was said, what was meant, and what was emotionally going on was enormous. How does a little turtle understand a smiling older turtle with rage in their eyes? Believe me, Little turtles, like little human kids, are all about survival. So I figured it out. I would not listen to what my father said as much as I would pay attention to his actions, his looks, his breathing, his voice, his tone, etc. I began to understand him, not by listening to what he said. I built a model in my mind of him and in my, and, and in my head over the years. It was my mental model, but it was of him. I used my model of him to explain him to others and myself and to predict what he would do next. My model made me safer around it, around him, as it gave me predictive information. He became more reliable to me. When he came near me, I interpreted his actions through my lens of my model. He then learned to prefer my model. I then learned to prefer my model of my father to the actual person. Eventually, I could carry on a conversation with him even when he wasn't around. I would say my, my sentence and my model of him would pop up with a response. Now, I know this is all about projection and stuff like that, but it also was about a built-in survival. When I was much older, I was walking home one day, and I had a debate, a debate with my wife, and I argued it out with her all the way home, trying different starting sen sentences. Um, mind you, she was at home, and I was talking to the rocks on, along the path, and to the image of her in my mind. When I got home, I saw her and offered her my best starting line. Her response was completely different from what she had said on the path on the way home in my mind. I was stunned. I learned that my model of Mrs. Turtle lives on the path and, and in my head, and that the real Mrs. Turtle lives at home. The two were not the same. I realized that I had preferred, perfect, preferred my model to Mrs. Turtle to the real Mrs. Turtle. So I set about to remedy the situation. Alfred continued as we walked through the tunnel, getting warmer as we went. On the path, I often test couples for this situation. In talking to one partner, I will ask them why their partner does something. Do you know why, do you know why she does that? Most people sitting less than a foot away will prefer to answer from the internal model they have than ask the person sitting next to them. If they say, I don't know why they do that, I will ask them where the answer is. Very few pop up with the answer. The answer, you see, is in them. I think it's critical to teach people the difference between their model of why their partner does things and their partner's model of why they do things. I have learned that humans usually build mental models of themselves. 
as a small turtle, my model contained my answers for what I did when when as a small turtle, my model contained my answers for why I did what he what he did. I would figure myself out and add bit by bit to my model. I recall sitting, looking into the bright sky, and then looking at the small things that moved across my vision, the things on the surface of my eyeball. I would gently poke the side of my eyeball to see these things shift pay, place. I would blink to see them all move up a little. I then decided that they were dust spots in the thin liquid of my eyeballs. If someone asked me what these dots were in their eyes, I would tell them what I had figured out about my eyes. Over the years, I repeated this process over and over, figuring things out about myself. Bit by bit, I built a reliable model of me. I would change, it would change over time as I added to it. Now I have come to realize that this was and is my model of myself. It is the vast collection of answers to the question, who am I? The greatest impetus to building this confronting model of myself were the questions from others. Who are you? Anyone remembered the caterpillar? Anyone remember the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland? Why how it would ask, why did you do that? As a kid, I was taught I had to answer these questions, but what answer would I give? I discovered that I had two answers. It was either my guess of what they wanted me to say or my silent answer to myself. I have two selves. Yep, my mental model of my father included what he wanted me to say about me. He would help me by telling me who he thought I was. You're tired. You're, you're lazy. You're sloppy. All these you messages helped me grasp who he thought I was and helped me figure out the answer he wanted when he asked me. Why did you do that? Because I am lazy, I said. I called this model my defined self, the one people have told me I am, the one I have learned I sh that I should be. But remember, while people are telling me who I should be, I also have that other self, the one I, one I have learned I am. What I've learned is that many people have not built a very strong, reliable model of who they are. And at the end, and at the same time, they, they have a strong idea of who other people think they are and should be. They can get these confused very easily. I have a friend who told me that yesterday he had a nice day until he got home. Then he had a bad, then he was bad. I asked him who it was he thought he was bad. He said, it was my wife. It was her idea, not his. But he didn't have a strong model of himself. And so, as he, as he was describing his day, he switched from telling me of himself, I had a nice day, to telling me of his defined self, I am bad, thinks my wife, without his own awareness. I, th I see this as one, one of the clues to what is often called codependence, and I've come across, and and I have come to see validation as one of repairing, curing, and pre and preventative actions for the problems of codependence. I see lack of validation in childhood as one of the causes of codependence. We will give we will get we will get more on this later. Alfred continued to speak. The talk was long, but the conversation made the time go faster. So I listened and kept my feet moving. And he continued. I mentioned earlier that as you look at your partner, you tend to like or dislike parts of them. This is equally true of how you see yourself. We can look at the two models of ourself, self and defined self, and like or dislike parts of them. Liking yourself I call self-esteem. Liking your defined self I call other esteem. My definition of self-esteem is I like myself even when they hate me. My definition of other esteem is I like myself if they like me. For many years, I was aware that I was trying to do what is right. At one time, I thought of putting that on my tombstone. He tried to do it right. I would say that with a cry in my voice to get others to see I was trying. In 
in the face of their defining me as lazy, irresponsible, sloppy, careless, or selfish. I found a solution to this problem when one day, a long time ago, my boss spoke to me. You see, at the time I was an intern at the University of Life working in the boiler room. Now, believe it or not, I used to want to be an engineer. I came to my boss one day and said that I was sorry that I didn't feel much energy today and was probably not being very productive. He said this apologetically as I knew I was lazy. He looked startled. Alfred, he said, on one of your slow days, you produce double what anyone else is doing. Take your time today. It's fine with me. I was stunned. My parents and teachers had judged me as lazy all my life, and here was a boss, a man paying me wages, who saw me as super productive. How could this be? The answer was in the difference between myself and my defined self. I am a, I am a turtle who works very hard at what I want to work on. I love a thing done well. I am a turtle who frequently re, re, rebels at what seems like arbitrary orders. When I am resisting doing what other turtles or frogs or whatever want, they tell me, they call me lazy and irresponsible. When I'm learning something, practicing in order to make it perfect, trying to do better, struggling with my own independence to be perfect immediately, they call me sloppy and careless. When I'm thinking my own thoughts and not thinking about them, they call me thoughtless and selfish, etc. Can you see the two cells weaving their way through these sentences? As I began to separate myself from my defined self, I realized how I had been trying for much of my life to get others to like me. I was, I was pained when they didn't. I had become a people pleaser, constantly managing my, my defined self. I wanted them to like me, so I would contort myself until they did, until they told me that they liked me the me they thought I was. I copied their values. I became like them. I avoided conflict. I lived in what I believed were their thoughts. But who was I? Here, by the way, is what I think is another clue to codependence. When I went to high school, I studied French. My French teacher came from France and had a wonderful accent. I learned to mimic his accent. I liked that. We had a German teacher, and I found myself mimicking his accent. I knew a person at home from Portugal, and I would mimic their accent. I love British accents. One day I was chatting with a friend, David, and he said, By the way, Alfred, which is your accent? I didn't know. My inability to answer scared me. One day my dad called me immature. The tone was one of a put-down, and I hurt. I thought he didn't like me. I went to school and asked my English teacher what the word immature meant. He told me that it was, it was a term, and I was stunned again. Now, I had two terms I didn't understand. I preserved, I, I preserved and looked up the, I persevered and looked up the terms in the dictionary and spoke more about it with my English teacher. I learned that the term immature involves a definition of behavior that is specific to a community. I asked how big the community could be. He told me the world was a community, a nation is a community, a town is a community, a family is a community. I asked if, in the case of the meaning, meanings of words, could one person be a community? He said, absolutely. We all have different meanings for the words we use. I studied, I studied Dad. He used immature in an interesting fashion. Mature meant anything he did. Immature meant anything he didn't like. I learned a joke that immature meant anything I did. I decided then and there that since... He thought I was immature, then I thought Dad was immature. Well, I was a young turtle then. You see, and I began to, I, you see, as I began to separate myself from my defined self, what they thought of me, I began to see that I was a pretty damn good turtle. I began to like myself. I began to build self-esteem, a reliable sense of liking, the liking of me. Not only did I discover that I was trying to do well all the time, but I liked the values I had. The values I had, my values, were the best I could come up with. I've not yet put all this together in a single chart, but I find all this, these points necessary to being an expert in validation. 
like my cello teacher, I had to practice keeping all these things in my mind when I started talking about who you are or who I am. The use of mirroring helped. When I would talk, Mrs. Turtle would reflect back my statements about myself and my statements about my defined self. I would do the same for her. Practice helps us see the distinctions between the four cells present more and more clearly and more and more reliably. As I hope you will see, I was in learning to validate that we both helped each other break the traps of codependency, people-pleasing, and to build the beauty of a strong sense of self. I believe true self only emerges in relationship. We emerged from the tunnel and back to the warmth of the university. Alfred looked at me and said, Class dismissed. You have had a lot for one day. Go now and relax. We will take this up again tomorrow. So I bid farewell to Alfred for the day and ventured on to find my room once again. The frog people were all around, ready to act and meet my every need. I found my way easily, though, and proceeded to relax and enjoy the amazing comforts of my great room on the second floor. It was very comfortable, comfortable to say the least.